Chicken is in the house.
you see these two? This is the pulpit. No, no of course you just to do that. But you're muting it. Yeah, that's because I'm going to use the pulpit. I'm going to use this one. All right. If, if you don't want to echo. If they're both working, they'll switch. Okay. Which one's my... A uh, commentary for the adults uh -huh. class uh -huh. and a uh, leader for the uh, students over the phone uh -huh. through Lifeway. And I thought they said they would be here this last week, but I haven't found them anywhere. But uh, Beverly said that she had to call Lifeway tomorrow and there anyway, uh -huh. so she was going to ask about it. Okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Because I wasn't sure what ha what they do if nobody's here, you know. Yeah, a lot of times they leave them um, on the back, but sometimes if it's something just by itself, they might not. So yeah. she, can, she can call and find out. Okay. Where are you going, sis? I'm going to go give some of these. Yeah. There's two of them along these candies. Thank you, though, that was nice. Remember, just the arrows, okay?
church, on this side we have the Southern Baptist, on this side we have the Northern Baptist. We're going to expect a lot more out of the Southern Baptists tonight. So let's sing 465, 1, 2, and 4. says when he was on the cross I was on his mind. How do you know that folks, what, what in my Sunday school class did I ask y'all for? What did I ask you for? Chapter and verse. Okay, now we're not going to do chapter and verse, but I believe when Jesus was on the cross he said, Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And he wasn't talking just about the people that were there at the cross that day. He was talking about you and me today because when he was on the cross I was on his mind. <clears throat> I've made mistakes, some 
First book of Scripture, to the book of Genesis, the 28th chapter. Appreciate your attendance tonight, whether you count yourself a Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist. I joined over here with the, is that, we're, we're Southern, right? I'm just going to preach to them and I hear my people over here. Te yeah, technically that would be the South, yeah. Genesis 28, we're, we're finding ourselves doing the, the same thing, uh, as I mentioned last Sunday night as we're going through Genesis, every chapter is kind of self-contained, meaning you, you kind of have to study the whole chapter because it's one cohesive unit, it's one story. Uh, we can accurately say that the rest of the book of Genesis pertains to the life of Jacob. Uh, we're we're going to go from with him from here forward. We had Abraham. And then we had Isaac, and now the blessing went to Jacob, and we're going to go forward with that story uh, of Jacob. And this chapter specifically is an interesting one where he uh, meets God at, at Bethel. He sees the, the vision of the, the stairway to heaven, uh, the ladder to heaven, depending on the, your translation tonight. Uh, very interesting story. I want to start in verse 1, and we'll read through verse 9, and then we'll, we'll dive in and, and talk about the scripture for a few minutes tonight. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply, that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away. He went to Padam Aram, to Laban, to the son of Bethuel, the Arme Arme Armene, 
Aramine, excuse me, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, and Esau. Now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Paddan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him, saying, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Paddan Aram. So Esau saw the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac, and Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, uh, Malatha and the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaioth. Esau's going to do the wrong thing. Okay? Jacob's going to do the right thing in kind of the wrong way. We're, we're going to continue to have this, this theme. Once you remember last week, we talked about when siblings, when parents, when families are kind of divided among themselves and kind of having friction among each other, that, that doesn't just go away. Those decisions and those hard feelings continue, and they go on and on and on, and we're going to come back to that. In chapters 28 through 31, Jacob is going to have trouble with Laban, uh, the man that he, he gets his wife from. There's going to be trickery. There's going to be deceit. Chapter 32 and 33, he's going to meet Esau again, and there's going to be trouble with his brother. And then in chapter 34 and following, he's going to have trouble with his own sons. Family difficulties don't go away. Uh, especially in this culture. Notice back to verse 1. I want to talk about something that we actually talked about this morning. He, he's told to go and, and get a wife from another group of people. Uh, we talked in Sunday school this morning in Ephesians, and Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is so uh, deep with theology. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, when we get to those kind of in the middle of October, are going to be a lot of application. But the first three are about God's people, Israel, and God's people, the church, and kind of that issue. Uh, again, God's timing always kind of amazes me. Uh, in Senior Bible, I teach world religions for the first month or so. We just finished Judaism, and so we've been talking about a lot of Jewish cultural things and, and such. And they take it really seriously. Chuck shared this morning about with uh, the genetic stuff that we have now, a lot of Jewish people going back and finding their genealogy all the way back to which tribe they're from. When they have those issues within Judaism, within Jewish families, they take it really seriously. Their culture is really important to them. So notice verse 1. Jacob, don't go out here and marry these Canaanites. Stay within our people. Don't, don't follow along with them. Don't go do the things that they do. Stay within our people. And so that's what I want us to think about to start tonight. Hannah, go to that next slide. So when you look at verse 1 through 9 that I read, is the venture. Jacob's going to go out and deal with it. The real reason Jacob engineered his departure from home was to avoid the anger of Esau. Go back to chapter 27 and look at verse 41. Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing. Now, she knew there was going to be trouble in the home, so she comes over here, and Rebecca again kind of says, hey, here's what you ought to do. Go find you a godly wife. You ever bought a piece of fruit? We're, we're going to get rid of this old boy. He's heavy, isn't he, man? Y'all moved him a few times? He, he's solid. I, I have bought furniture before that on the outside looked solid, but it had just a real thin piece of the good wood on the outside, and then inside it was just old cheap wood. What's that thin piece called? Veneer, Veneer right? It looks good outwardly, but there's no substance to it. Rebecca's call, hey, Jacob, go find you a godly wife, is just a veneer. She wants to look like she's doing the right thing. She just wants her son to get out of the house because there's going to be trouble with Esau. So, so it's, it's just picking up. Go back to chapter 24 and verse 1. Notice what, what we talk about there. And again, all these stories, they intertwine, so I'm sorry that I'm, I'm, I'm jumping here. But Abraham was old. The Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to his servant, please place your hand under my thigh. He sent his son out for Isaac. He wanted Isaac to have a godly wife. That, that was his desire, and that was all he had. He didn't have an ulterior motive or any other thing going on. He just wanted that. Uh, so she's mimicking that, but we're going to see later that wasn't really her desire. So just kind of follow that away and keep that in your head. Uh, according to Scripture, Esau's worldly wives were causing trouble. When God's people marry people from outside of God's covenant, that's always going to be the case. I've got to tell you as a pastor, you know, I've, I have a prerequisite. If you want to get married and you're a young couple, we're going to do premarital counseling. Okay? It's not going to solve all your problems, but it's going to open your eyes to some of the stuff you're going to deal with. I've got some great stuff from the Arkansas Baptist State Convention to do that with. And I cannot tell you the number of times I've literally had to look at a couple and say, guys, this is going to be trouble because you want different things. Not many times, um, but a few times I've had to, to say I'm, I can't do this wedding. Because you had a strong believer who wanted godly things and then somebody who didn't want to have anything to do with God. I'm sorry, but it's just going to be problems. It's going to be difficulty and I've, I've seen too much of it after the fact. We're going to see that here. 
We're going to see that going on. Esau is going to marry wives that are not part of God's family, and there's going to be nothing but trouble, nothing but problems, nothing but issues outside of that. Faith is living without scheming. I want to read you a passage from the book of James, chapter 4, verse 13. It says this. the book of James talks about. We can do the right thing, but if we do it for the wrong reason, we don't get credit for that. And so we have to, as believers, do the right thing and do it for the right reason. Why do we live and exist to glorify God, period? That's it. Believers, that's our calling. That's what we're supposed to do. No matter what it is we do, we're to glorify God in every single thing that we do. Colossians 3.23 tells us that. So just keep that in mind. Keep that in focus. One more thing before we go on to the next point. I want to remind you that, that Jacob is not a young man here. This is not youthful uh, silliness. Jacob is at least 70, uh, excuse me, 77 years old at this time. There's a lot of other passages we have to put together to get that age, but he, he knows how he ought to act. He knows what he ought to do, and he still chooses to do some things that are not good, and that's going to come back to get him later. Go to verse 10 with me. Notice the second thing tonight, the vision that he has. It says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba went toward Haran, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of the place, put it under his head, and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. This is the vision that he has. Jacob is going to meet with God. At this point, he's traveled about 70 miles from Beersheba to Bethel, about a three-day journey. He's going out on this venture, this trip that he took. He took one of the stones, and as he laid there, he, he, he went to sleep, and he saw this vision. God visited him, and that's, that's literally what Bethel means. Bethel means the house of God. The L at the end is speaking of God, El Shaddai, Elohim, those things. So Bethel is house of God. That's where he is. That's the place that he is, and he, and he sees this picture. There's at least seven of these in Scripture, all in the book of Genesis, starting here, and we're going to see six more of them as we go forward. God's going to commune with his people and talk to him. This particular picture shows God's care. Look at verse 12. A ladder or staircase was set up on the earth, and it went to heaven. The angels were ascending and descending. Some were going up to God. Some were coming down to the people. This speaks of God's care. God was still with him. When God makes a covenant or a promise, he always keeps his word. He keeps his part of the deal. God has made a covenant with us that he will hold on to us, that he will keep us, that He will the, the work of salvation he started in us, he will finish. From, from predestination, to Romans 8 talks about he foreknew, he predestined, he conformed, he justified, he glorified. All those things are in the past tense, meaning God has taken care of all those things. So this vision is a beautiful thing. I think a companion passage to this is in John chapter 1, when Jesus is calling the disciples and he calls Nathaniel and he says, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And so before I saw you, I called you. Before I knew you, before I had interacted with you, I called you. The book of Jeremiah says that we're known in the womb, that when God forms us, he, he knows everything about us. The book David writes in the Psalms that every day of our life is numbered in the books of God. It's a beautiful thing to serve this God that knows us in this way. Notice thirdly, the voice. Pick up with me in verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Verse 14, your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised to you. Visions apart from the word of God are deceiving. Any vision, any promise of God much match up with the word of God. Notice in this vision, he just reiterates the promises God has already made to Abraham and to Isaac. They match scripture. If you ever hear anyone say, well, God told me to do this, again, as Don said, chapter and verse. If it doesn't match scripture, it's not of the Lord. Yeah. Plain and simple. Our, our Bible is the holy, perfect word of God. It is our guide. Notice in verse 13, he gives him three promises I put up here on the slide. The first one is the land. 
Chapter 13, verse 14, this promise was first given to Abraham. It was reaffirmed to Isaac in chapter 26 in the first five verses. God's people will possess this land. Uh, Obadiah chapter 17, another Old Testament passage that says this will happen. As I've said a couple times before as we're going through this study, God's people have never fully possessed all the land they were promised. Okay? In the Old Testament, it, it, he gave them the parameters. He told them from this river to this place there. Israel has never possessed at all. So I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Do you think God keeps his promises? So they will one day. God's not done with the people of Israel. Okay? Uh, that does not mean we blindly support anything that they say and do. We just realize God still has a purpose for those people. He still has things he's going to do with those people. And we should be aware of that. Okay? They're going to possess the land. Notice the second thing he promised them is in verse 14, the seed. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the east, west, north, and the south. In, in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This assured Jacob God would give him a wife. Otherwise, he wouldn't have descendants. Uh, today, God's people, the Jewish people, the descendants of Jacob, are literally on every point of the compass, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. Notice the last part of verse 14. All the families of the earth shall be blessed through his family. This speaks of the Messiah. This speaks of Jesus Christ. Through the Jewish people, through the line of Jacob, we can trace it all the way back, and Jesus comes through that line. I have been blessed by the family of Jacob because I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, so have you. So, so this promise has, has been fulfilled and will continue to be fulfilled. The multiplied seed, and look in verse 15, perhaps the most important thing for Jacob is God's presence. Behold, I am with you, will keep you wherever you go, will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This promise was from God to Jacob. However, what we can learn from this promise is that God keeps his promises and God is faithful. So even though this promise isn't given directly to us, we can, we can take from this promise. If he was going to be with Jacob and he promised him that and he fulfilled that promise, we can say the same thing. God has promised to be with us and God will fulfill that promise for us. Perhaps more than anything, I don't want to re-preach the sermon from this morning, but we need the presence of God, do we not? We need God to go with us. I have just, I don't know what I've felt lately. It's been a very interesting few weeks. I think our church has been tremendously blessed by some of the folks that have come to us and that God has sent to us. Um, with Brother Joy, Miss Laverne's husband, and, and with Miss Martha both, I have just, that, that has gone over and over in my head that I wish we could have known them longer. Uh, I wish we could have got to know them, um, especially with Miss Martha. I, again, I stood in the foyer. Jake had joined our fellowship, and so folks were coming around and, and hugging him, and we're so glad he's here as well. And, and Martha came through. She sat up close, so she went through early, and it was just her and I in the foyer, and we prayed because uh, she was going to start treatment that week. And she just looked at me and said, whatever this week has, I'm ready because my hope's in Jesus. She had no idea that she was going to go see Jesus, but God did and had given her a peace and a comfort about that, and I'm just continually amazed at God's perfect time, even when it hurts, you know, even when it hurts, even when it's not what we would want or what we would necessarily desire, but God has always timed things just perfectly, and, and, and so as, as pastoring and just with our fellowship, the joy that we've had with those folks coming, the difficulty, the heartache that we've had because we've lost some of them almost as quickly as we gained them, uh, but heaven gained them as well, and, and they gained a, a presence with Jesus. We need to remember that. Jacob, before we leave this point, in verse 15, his personal presence, Jacob's about to have some hard years. In fact, if, if we go through and, and think about what he's going to do and, and how he's going to live, it's going to take 20 years for Jacob to fully surrender to God. 20 years where he's going to go and, and do some things he shouldn't do, go and uh, live some ways he shouldn't live. It's going to take him a long time to mature and really come to, to that place where he really trusts God and he's really following God, yet God's presence is going to be with him. Guys, God doesn't leave us when we mess things up. That's good news, right? Because otherwise God would be far away from a lot of us. Man, we're, we're going to make some silly choices and do some silly things, and, and we're going to do some... Let's not mince words. We're going to do some sinful things. And we're going to make sinful, selfish choices. God doesn't leave us. Now, are there repercussions to those choices? Almost every single time. Hebrews tells us that God disciplines those he loves. And so sometimes we're going to do things and there's going to be discipline. There's going to be, God will allow us or, or direct us into hardships. 
Now, sometimes we go through hardships just because it's a sinful world and, and it's a fallen nature and we're broken people and that happens. So, so we don't, and it's not our job to, to do that. Can you imagine me as the preacher saying, well, you know, I, guys, I know why mom is going through this because she sinned a couple weeks ago. and that, That's not our job. And that's not our call. And I, I'll be honest with you, from my own life, that's the only one I know really well. There's been difficulties I've gone through, and sometimes I don't know if it's because I've sinned and made a silly, sinful choice, or if it's because that's just the nature of things. It, it, it doesn't matter. Here's what we need to say. Not how can I get out of this, but what can I get out of this? What can I learn from God's testing or trials or difficulties? Sometimes we make it hard on ourselves. Jacob's going to make it hard on himself for about 20 years. We have other stories in the book of Job. Job was such a righteous man. His kids would get together and have feasts and celebrate, and he would come and bring an extra sacrifice to God. You know what he said? He said, perhaps one of my children has dishonored God in their heart, so I'm going to bring this extra sacrifice. He, he was the picture of righteousness, yet what happened to him? He lost everything. So we don't know many times where the trial comes from, but we can always lean on the God of all comfort. We need the presence of the Lord whether we're going through a good time, a bad time, or any time in between. Let's close with the last verses. Notice verse 16, the vow. Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone he put under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on its top. He called the name of the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone which I've set up as a pillar will be God's house and all, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. The house of God, Jacob exclaims. So again, that's what Bethel means. His experience that not only changed him, but changed the name of the place. To commemorate that event, he set up a pillar and made an offering. I think this is a good thing. In fact, look up here. We have this table right here. What does it say on the front of this table? Do this in remembrance. It's good for us to have things that, that make us look back. Y'all probably get tired of hearing about it, but I love the, the thing that I have on my phone, that the time off that shows me different things I've posted in the past. Because it reminds me. I'll go back and read. You know, I posted this, or I was this going through this, or I had this good thing or bad thing happen. I like to go back and look at those things. Uh, we're at the time of the year in August and September where there's a lot about my kids because about 10 years ago the kids came to us, and so we were posting stuff every day uh, about how blessed we were. We need to look back and remember those things. We need to pause at the Lord's table and remember those things. When we have a baptism with, with uh, Eli here in a few weeks, that, that's a remembrance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We need those memorials. Uh, at school this year, our, our president, we, we took stones. We looked at the story of David and Goliath, and we carry those stones, and we just have them on our desk or in our pocket, and they're reminders of us of things that we want to work on and do. So Jacob does that here. Jacob shows his faith. Uh, he, he gave something, but there's a difficulty with this passage. Notice verse 20. He says, if God will be with me. And he says, if a couple times. Now, here's the issue. In Hebrew which I, I do not claim to be a scholar, but in Hebrew, the same word can be translated if or since. And, and, and we're left to, this happens in Greek many times too, the translator is left to figure out which one it is based on the context. So let's read it both ways. Verse 20, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food and I return to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. It could also be saying, since, verse 20, since God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I will take and will give me food and return to my father's house, the Lord will be my God. I, I, I like since better, right? Because uh, he's expressing his faith, but, but we don't know. Here's what we do know. He makes a vow, and he basically says, God's going to be with me. I'm going to live for God. And, and, and he does his best to do that. Uh, he, he tries to do that, and we're going to see him wrestle with God later, get his name changed later, and issues there. But he promises for God to be his God. He promises to give God some of his tithing and, and what he possesses and those things. It was an expression of faith and obedience, and there's a, a lesson there for tithing God's people that we could do some other times. But here's this. Jacob did not, did not always live up to his vow. Jacob means what? Deceiver or trickster? He's about to meet a man who's going to be his match and then some. Laban's going to trick him multiple times, and he's going to have difficulty with that vow. 
For 20 years, the two of them are going to try to outsmart each other. But in the end, because Jacob has been to Bethel, he's going to keep his promises. I just want to remind us to close with this. He's been to the place, the house of God, so have we. We have been in the house of God today, and like many of you here recently, I think it's been a wonderful Sunday. I'm refreshed and renewed by being with God's people. We sang that song this morning. That without a doubt, we'll know we've been revived when we leave this place. I feel that. And I pray that you have too. As we go out, let's be like Jacob in this sense. Let's keep our vows. We've sang together. Admiration to God. Obedience to God. We've prayed together. We've studied scripture together. May we go keep those promises as we leave this place. Let's pray together again tonight. Father, I thank you for your scripture. I thank you for showing us great lessons out of each chapter and verse. God, any place that we turn, we can see your presence. We can see your fingerprints. God, we can see your instruction. We can see your love and grace. May we be practicers of those things. May we put them into practice daily as we go out and live this week. No matter what we may face, no matter what we may go through, God, may your presence guide and direct us. That we could say, as Jacob said, that God is in this place. As we go to our homes, to our work, any place that we go this week, knowing the Holy Spirit is with us in every way. Thank you for a wonderful day in your house. May you be honored by the way that we live our lives as we leave this place tonight. We love you. We trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people would say, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together tonight. Uh, Brother Art uh, shared with me this morning that... Uh,